fuck boys. Boom. How's it going, everybody? And welcome back to the Real FI Podcast. I'm your host, Patrick McGrath, with my lovely co-host, James Ripion. How's it going today, James? It's going well, Patrick. I am super excited for today's guest. We have Michael Elefante here with us. And I have a sneaking suspicion we're going to learn a little bit more about Airbnbs, uh, short-term rentals, and that great business model that everyone seems to be getting into these days. It's a sellable model, probably because it makes a lot of money. Um, so with that being said, you know, let's get into it. Michael, uh, why don't you tell us a little bit about what you got going on, your business, and the things that you're kind of into right now? Yeah, for sure. I appreciate you guys having me on. Um, so I currently have a lot going on. A lot of that has kind of sprouted and grown over the past like two to three years, but it's been about three years, about two weeks ago, since I launched my first short-term rental um, and have since scaled to six properties that I own, focus more on the larger properties, four plus bedrooms. Um, they currently do 80 to you know, hundred plus thousand a month in revenue combined. Um, and I also do some coaching. So I offer a coaching program to teach other people. I've worked with over 900 people on how to basically um, find, invest in, stand up, design, um, automate and manage short-term rentals successfully. So listing on Airbnb, Verbo, those types of sites. Um, and then I also have a property management company where we manage other people's properties, um, hopefully to increase their revenue um, and do, do their property service um, and, and a few other businesses that have sprouted out along the way. But um, I do a lot on social media. So if you guys are familiar with my name, um, I'm, I'm, you know, have a decent following on both Instagram and TikTok and do a lot of content mostly around short-term rentals or just the overarching theme of financial freedom. Perfect. So I, I do have one question. You, you started off by kind of talking about the properties that you do have, and you mentioned larger, maybe four bedrooms or more. Um, what what kind of made you want to go that route with going larger Airbnb properties? And uh, what's the difference between maybe going to look for like a small two bedroom place versus uh, finding these larger properties uh, as far as your business model goes? Yeah, as I, as I started out, I had a four bedroom as my first one. The second one was actually a two bedroom condo, which is one of our top performers. And those two are both in Nashville, but have since tried to stay on track for the larger ones. And, and the reason behind that was we had self-managed up till about a month ago until I offloaded my own properties to my own property management team. Um, and with self-managing, it takes just about the same exact amount of effort to manage one big property as it does one small one. And sometimes more with the one small one, because you have to check in probably more groups of guests each month. Um, and once you automate, you know, the day-to-day -day guest communication and the communication with your cleaners, um, it takes about the same amount of effort. And I'd rather put forth the same, or I'd rather manage one property that cash flows me five to 10 K a month than manage three properties that cash flow me five to 10 K a month. Um, so that's my mindset behind that was just to scale thoughtfully and, and target properties that have higher cash flow potential. That's awesome. <clears throat> I mean, you hear it you see it a lot on, um, on social media, you know, the, the bigger homes, you know, they get the bigger nightly rates, you know, and people are kind of like pulling their money together, uh, you know, friends going on a trip together instead of what they would pay, you know, by themselves for a one or two bedroom place. They're all pitching up that same amount to get a really, really nice place. Um, and especially you're where you have, uh, your properties in Nashville, or at least some of them, I mean, that's a huge tourist destination. People are going there year round, like for concerts, for football games, you know, for hockey games, just for going for the music for downtown. Like I spent a ton, a ton, a ton of time in Nashville and, you know, for buying it three years ago, you definitely got it right before the shoot up. I mean, Nashville was already going crazy. It's like one of my biggest regrets. I worked there uh, since 2017, um, helping like build all the high rises around there. And I regret so much like not getting an apartment there. That's like probably one of my biggest, you know, investment mishaps was not getting a place in Nashville around that time. So um, let's rewind a little bit and kind of talk about why you got into Airbnb and what it was, you know, that had, uh, I believe it's you and your wife, like you and your wife to like do that. I've seen a bunch of your videos. So let's, let's rewind the clock a little bit and kind of take us to that like initial step into Airbnbs. Yeah, I think I got to rewind back to, you know, 2015, 2016. Um, I was a college athlete, played baseball through college. So that's where like all my focus was. I was trying to get drafted, play professionally. Uh, I graduated in 2015 and had the option to come back for a fifth year. 
I hadn't decided what I wanted to do. I did not get drafted. I had some injuries. Um, and I was down in South Florida training and I was doing an internship at a commission only sales job, like pre-selling this awful product, did not make a single sale, knew nothing about sales at the time. I either had no direction. Um, and I needed to make money. So I applied for all these different jobs, internships, restaurant jobs, and it's slow season in South Florida in the summertime. The only place, the only two places that interviewed me, and I had a finance degree from Elon University, a, a pretty great business school in the Southeast, um, was Dunkin' Donuts and Chipotle. So Chipotle, I got beat out by a couple of high school students um, and Dunkin' Donuts ended up hiring me. So that's what I was doing five in the morning pouring coffees for like 725 an hour. I was like, what am I doing? You know, working the sales job in the afternoon, making no money. Then I would go train in the evening at a facility. Decided to go back for a fifth year. Um, still didn't get drafted, which was fine. I enjoyed going back for that one last year of baseball. And then I was like, all right, now I got to figure out what I want to do with my life. Um, completely had to leave the one passion I had for probably, you know, the better part of 15 plus years, 20 years, um, and then find something new. So I got a, an entry level sales job for a tech company in Dallas, Texas, making like 35 grand a year, moved out there with no money in my pocket, started working my way up, way up the food chain. I knew that you could make good money in that industry. Um, very quickly learned to hate it though. So that was where I first started to learn about real estate and this overarching theme of financial freedom, because I wanted to stop trading my time for money. And even though I could work my way up the corporate ladder, work my way up the sales, um, roles, um, you know, I just started working more, more and more time. Um, so fast forward about three years from 2016 to 2019, I had read all the books, done a bunch of YouTube. I was like, I have to take action. Finally, I had worked my way up to an outside rep job. I'd moved from Dallas to Austin, to Nashville, Austin and Nashville being both tourism hotspots stayed in a few Airbnbs. And I just started to crunch numbers. And I'm like, maybe this is a better way for me to get started because I didn't want to do scale to 50 to hundred units to cash flow 10 to 20 K a month. I was like, how can I do it faster? I just, the fastest path to financial freedom. That's what I want. Um, so just started to crunch numbers and you know look at comps in the area um, and understood, okay, I could probably cash flow a few thousand with properties like this in Nashville. And that's just what led me to networking with a realtor who just got into the real estate game himself. And he was focusing on working with investors and he presented a property to me. And it's funny, you mentioned wishing you got properties in Nashville. I was so nervous. I'm like, I'm way overpaying for this property, bit the bullet, got that one, sold the truck. I just furnished, finished paying off to have enough money to furnish it. And so I traded it in for like a little Honda CRV, which I hated, but anyways, it was well worth it. Got that first property. And then the third month we were set to cash for like seven grand in a single month. And that was like the aha moment. I was all in at that point. Did you end up buying the truck back? Yeah, now I drive a Rivian R1T, which is pretty sweet. So nice. it was worth the wait, but I just got that finally this year. But yeah, it's been a wild couple of years. Um, then COVID hit, right? So that was in spring of 2020. That 7K cash flow month turned into like a 1K cash flow month because we had like 40 grand in cancellations in a week. And Airbnb overrode all our policies. I was still confident, maybe too optimistic, but I was like, this can't last forever. Who knows how long it'll last? But I think if I hold this property, maybe get another one or two during the next, however long this is going to you know, be on the horizon for, I think it'll be worth it in the long end. And so I like went probably one step, maybe too far. It worked out, but my wife and I both liquidated our 401k and our IRAs, bit the tax penalty to acquire our second unit in Nashville. Um, and yeah, we never looked back since then. Well, that's awesome. I mean, when COVID hit, I know many real estate investors were faced with the fight or flight option uh, when it came to the real estate. And it sounds like you fought, like you decided to take the risk, take the action and see the long-term vision for investing in that market. Are all of your short-term rentals in Nashville or do you have uh, some in other markets as well? Yeah. So we have two in Gatlinburg, Tennessee, so like the Smoky Mountains. And then we have two in Fort Lauderdale, Florida, just north of Miami. Um, and the reason we actually pivoted away from Nashville was because of how much it slowed down when the city basically shut down, like a lot of urban areas did, we saw all the travel after the first two months of like the initial fear and lockdown pivot to rural areas. And they were just exploding. Smokies were already busy for the past several decades. It's the most visited national park in the country. Um, so we pivoted there, got our first place in October, 2022, more of a cosmetic rehab. And the opportunity there was um, a lot of just old cabins. They look like grandma's cabins. And I was like, if we modernize a place that has good amenities, I think we'll do well. And like right out of the gate, we were just slam booked just because the demand was so high. But yeah, I ended up getting two there and then um, uh, two more in Florida as well. So let me ask you this question. 
and I'm curious to hear what you think because um, the, some might think that there's one good way to go when it comes to picking a market or Airbnb type. But you know, in my in, from what I've seen, I don't own any short term rentals or Airbnbs, but it seems like it's hard to lose, and it seems like you can't pick a bad market almost. Like I know people who have properties in the middle of bum f nowhere. And then people who've got properties, in Nashville, New York, all these metropolitan areas, and they seem to be just killing it everywhere. Have, have you come across a bad market to do this? Or, you know, am I just kind of ignorant to maybe some specifics that like might highlight where's, where's better or worse? I think some markets present more challenges, um, mostly from a regulation standpoint. So I try to, basically I look at the whole U.S. as a funnel. I try and funnel out markets that uh, regulatory things or, or laws are implemented where it makes it more troublesome for short-term rental investors to operate. Um, and I want to avoid places that will quickly change or have a history of changing and then saying, oh, you can no longer do this. I like Nashville because they'll grandfather in existing permits and say, you can still do this for as long as you own it. But from that, this point forward, the zoning is going to change and you have to be in zones X, Y, and Z to operate. So that's like the biggest thing for me. Um, but I think the other thing is just picking a winning property in a decent market. Too many people that I work with focus on finding that home run market and that perfect property. It's like, no, just find a decent market with tourism where the numbers make sense and just find the best possible opportunity that fits your budget. And then setting it up, designing it in a way to compete with top performing properties. And then the revenue management is probably the most important thing. Like if you know how to price and you have a decent property with good photos, like you're going to do extremely well, in my opinion. But a lot of people do not set it up right, don't do their research, and then they, they have no idea how to price. It's, <clears throat> that's uh, th those are like some really important and really important things to hone down in on. And, you know, we, we've had, we've had quite a few people that are in investing in Airbnbs and Airbnb is like their model that they go by. And every single one of them has a property or two in the Smokies. Every single one of them is investing in South Florida. Like, those are the places people in California, they're all everybody's kind of investing in that same area. So with that being said, do you still see the opportunities, you know, in those areas today? I mean, I'm sure a lot of people that are looking at Airbnbs that are looking at investing in short term rentals have seen the headlines recently, you know, is Airbnb dead? Is there an over influx of Airbnbs on the market, you know? Um, uh, what occupancy rates are plummeting, all of this FUD, you know, fear, uncertainty, and doubt in the market is, does that have, in your opinion, does that have any basis behind it? Are you seeing a change in the winds with Airbnb currently? I think it's definitely market dependent. There are certain markets, even the Smokies, I have not seriously looked at recently, because if you look at the supply uh, of vacation rentals on AirDNA on the overview page, a lot of places like Joshua Tree or even Scottsdale, but definitely the Smoky Mountains have increased by like 60% in rental supply in two years um, since pre-COVID. Whereas you look at a place like Nashville, where a lot of people are like, oh, nah, Nashville's oversaturated. You can't even hear me be there. I'm like, y'all don't do your research because Nashville still presents a great opportunity, in my opinion. They increased regulation, but st you're still able to do it after COVID hit and after COVID hit, everyone dumped their rentals. So the supply has barely peaked uh, or gone past the uh, Q4 2019 high. Um, so it's just very market dependent um, as far as how competitive it is. Uh, however, I think some of those headlines, you know, if you reference 2021 data for certain markets like the Smoky Mountains where it was just bonkers, everyone had pent up travel demand um, and we're out traveling, spending money and there wasn't enough supply to support that demand. So prices and occupancy were at all time highs. Um, now we're kind of reverting back to pre-COVID levels, which is still good. However, a lot of people purchased under the assumption where the numbers were going to be at 2021 highs. So they're freaking out like, oh, it sucks. We're not making any money. It's like, that's the whole research part. Like you can't bank on, you know, recent highs and, and assume that's going to be every single day for, for years to come. So you kind of have to be a little more conservative, in my opinion, on the forecasting um, and kind of stress test the investment when it comes to that. So how would, so how would someone like myself, you know, go about looking to, to one, uh, pick, pick a market. Let's say we pick one of those three markets, Nashville, Smokies, Florida. Okay. So first we pick a market, then how would we go about researching to make sure, you know, we're getting a decent deal. You know, we're not talking about a home run here. 
we're just talking about like a decent deal um, that that is going to do better than a long term rental. Like, what are your steps when you're looking for something like that? Yeah. So assuming we already understand the regulation and the permit requirements for that particular market, what I always do is start on AirDNA, um, maybe unconventional to most people. I actually start on the top property section. And I'm not looking at top properties to assume I'm going to compete with the number one or number two. However, what I am doing is I'm going to use the filters to say, hey, I'm looking for a four bedroom property in this market. And I could use those filters at the top and I can one, see where they're located on that map. I want to know, and you're going to notice that a lot of markets, they're clustered in certain pockets. And I've offered on properties sight unseen, not familiar with the market like Fort Lauderdale, but what I did have is a keen understanding of where the top revenue properties were located. Um, so that's a good start. So I want to be within like a half a mile or a mile of the other top performers. And then what I want to do is look on their actual listings, look at their photos. What amenities do they provide? Is it a pool? Is it an outdoor kitchen? Is it a game room? Is it a certain theme? Like what customer avatar are they catering toward? Is it bachelorette parties, families? Um, so you have to have a very good understanding of what to provide guests as well. Because ultimately we've been living in a digital world. You want to understand people are pulling out their phone. They're starting honed in on a certain area whether it's South Florida or downtown Nashville, they're looking for certain amenities and a certain distance from somewhere. And maybe they're looking for a view or a water feature, whatever it may be. Um, and then they're going to start to zoom out when they can't find anything with the, within their budget to find other accommodation. So that's like the, the main starting point. And then from there, you just have to have a sound investment analysis. It doesn't have to be anything crazy. Mine's very simple, just on a spreadsheet where I plug in the purchase price, the down payment, estimated closing costs, and you have to account for furniture as well. Um, and then I'll use AirDNA, occupancy and average daily rate numbers, historical data, and then I'll pair that with some comps I find. So you want to find like the top three to five places you feel you would compete directly with, honestly compete directly with. Then I pick apart their No account. fudging the numbers. No yeah, fudging no fudging the, the numbers, number. man. Because if you do, you will get screwed real quick if you think you're going to be, you know, at the 90th percentile of revenue, but you don't have a property that competes with them. Um, that's where people... Are like, oh, Airbnb's busting. You know, it's like, no, you just assumed you were going to be some top performer and it's just competitive, you know? Um, so, but you do want to find comps and look at the forward, forward looking data as well and then pick apart their calendar. What are they actually charging midweek, weekends, January, February, March, and every single month of the year? Don't just assume it's the same price year round um, and see how much they're booked and see, you know, what the booking lead times are. So that should really help all those factors play into the, again, the investment analysis has to be conservative. I'll run a low and a high forecast too, just to make sure I'm that low. And also like, what's my break-even point? And if my break-even point is so silly low for occupancy and ADR for my specific property, I feel really comfortable making that investment. Well, I think that's really important. I know, you know, a lot of people do jump into rentals, just regular, you know, SFR, single family rentals without having a strong appreciation of maybe cash flows because maybe they can, you know, handle that monthly nut of the mortgage payment and expenses pretty easily. But, you know, when you're getting into these Airbnb properties, they're typically going to be higher scale, uh, larger expenses, uh, upfront costs are going to be much higher. Um, so definitely got to be cognizant of those numbers, 100%. Um, one question I do have for you, you mentioned amenities. And I'm sitting here thinking like, okay, we're looking at the properties, we're seeing where the top performers are located, we're seeing what kind of things they have. Are there certain amenities that you'll look at and just be like, that's not worth the money, not worth the extra money. It's not worth the headache, like a pool, like a hot tub, uh, like a pool table that, you know, the balls are always going missing. So you don't feel like, you know, having to replace each damn time, like one goes missing somehow. Like, are there any amenities that you kind of don't feel are worth the trade-off, even if you'll be making extra money? Uh, I mean, that's a good question. I have never really thought about like what's not worth it, but I, what I will tell you is like, for example, if you didn't have a pool and you wanted to add one, you should get you know, multiple quotes and then factor that into the investment analysis. Let's make, say it cost me forty to $50,000 to put one in. I need to understand how much it's going to increase my ADR and occupancy throughout the year, roughly. Include that in your investment analysis, the additional cost. And does my cash on cash go up, down, or stay the same? And if it stays the same or goes up, it's probably worth the investment, especially if it goes up. However, if it if it's too expensive, but like it doesn't really provide any extra value, it's going to increase your booking volume and the daily rate, then it's not worth it. So like those types of amenities where it's going to be more costly um, may affect it. Uh, but you really just have to understand what market you're in. Like if you're in Scottsdale or Phoenix, you're going to want a pool or some type of water feature. You may want a little putting green or a fire feature. If you can have all of those things, it makes for one kick-ass first photo. 
And I'm all about that first, like what it looks like on your phone. It's like TikTok for me or, or Instagram. If I don't create, get your attention, create something that grabs your attention in two seconds, you guys are on to the next video. And we're all guilty of that. We're just like, swipe, swipe, swipe. Ooh, that's interesting. I'll watch this for five seconds. Am I still interested? Okay, now I'll watch the whole thing. Um, Airbnb is no different. Like you have one photo and a title to capture a click, right? You have the impression, the click through. And then once you're on the splash page, I have five photos. What are those five photos? How are you going to sell me on that property to earn a click to see all the photos and read the description? Because most people won't do it. You know, they're going to write you off. And that's why a lot of legacy property managers are getting crushed by individual operators or even my property management company is because we just know how to market. Um, we know we operate in the digital age. So like that, though, that's really crucial too. So it's not just what amenities you have, but make sure people know you have them, you know, in the first photo or first five photos. Cause I've seen too many listings that have a really awesome fire pit and something that maybe like string lights in the backyard grill station. But I didn't even know until like the 50th photo they had that. So like, I would never know, you know? So um, yeah, it's just yeah, I think that's, really important. I think that is um, one of the big uh, differentiating factors between, you know, long term investing and short term investing when it comes to real estate is <clears throat> when you're investing long term, you 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 are really more of a real estate type uh, focused um, investor when you're a short term rental investor. The real estate is a small is a small part of it. It's really more of the hospitality mindset, the marketing mindset. You know, you you need you need to know a lot more about the data sets of your customer, you know, and, and everything else. I mean, and and it's real. It's a lot more niche down than am I a, a B class, C class, A class? You know, um, for a long term tenant that's going to live there for a year, you're 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 having to pick out people that are going to spend their vacation you know, or a weekend at, at your property. And you need to know, you know, a lot more different factors on, you know, how much income they have, you know, the type of person that they are, like what amenities that they want, where, why they're even coming to this area, you know, is there wedding venues close by? Is it because of a concert venue, all these different, you know, things like, so I think there's a lot more research and a lot more work involved in that. But again, your cash flow, your risk to reward, I think is a lot higher because of those aspects as well. When all those, you know, things kind of align and are done right. Yeah. Yeah. I think you hit the nail on the head. It's uh, it's definitely more of a meticulous investment, I think. Um, and there's definitely a lot that still goes into making successful long-term rental investments or multifamily for sure, but it is different. It's, you're right. It's a little bit, you have to factor in the hospitality aspect as well. Yeah. So let, let, let's take a look at what you said. You have six properties now. Yeah. So you've got six properties now, you said between 80 and 100K. And now is the 80 and 100K, is that gross each gross. month? Gross. gross each month. So what are, you, what are you cash flowing off these, you know, six Airbnbs, um, you know, that are bringing in almost 90, average and 90 grand a month? I'd say our margins today are probably 35 to 40%. Um, Sometimes higher, just depends on the month. But I would say on average, cash flow is like 30 to 40K a month. 30 to 40K a month. And so let's take it back. So 2019, you were working there in Texas or, or in Nashville, right? And what what were you what were you bringing in around that time? 2019 for that we launched uh in December of 2019. So that was our before first the property. Airbnbs. Yeah, before, before, the, before Airbnbs. the Airbnbs. So I had just gotten into an outside sales role. So I had like changed jobs several times, which is probably against most traditional wisdom, right? Like you want to stick it out with the company, work your way up. I was like, if I'm going to get paid more here, I'm changing jobs. So I changed up multiple times, got a promotion or two. Um, and I think I was making like two to 300 grand a year total earnings between uh, mostly commission, um, just yep. through sales. I, and I, I, I kind of want to preface that too, is like, look, everyone who's listening that's out there that can't figure out how to get the money to start doing this, like go get a commission job. I mean, that's what I did. I mean, that's what James is doing. That's what you did. Like I didn't have a degree in anything, you know, but I could sell. So I was in, you know, a high ticket item sales job and was able to make, you know, 125, $150,000 a year, you know, with a, with a wife that's making really good money. And then all of a sudden, getting those down payments for those properties and, you know, investing becomes a lot easier. And like you making two, 300 grand a year, it only took you three years 
and now you supplemented that income plus some and you and it's you know as long as you have these properties and it's only going to continue to grow you're not beholden to a boss you're not beholden really to to market conditions inside of the company like you were in three years have been able to build a business that uh you know you've been able to quit your job and not only this is just the airbnb aspect you said you're managing you know 80 other 80 other people's properties you know you've got your courses and everything else so you've in three years of really really hard work you know you've been able to build an entire kind of business empire um just by really putting in the time and taking the action which i think is awesome yeah yeah it's kind of cool looking back honestly and uh outside of the airbnb stuff with um, with the content creation side, like I was pushing content for a year, year and a half before I made a single penny. And like, you know, I'm not good at, I still don't think I'm that good at content creation, but it was just that consistent effort. Um, and, and like the long-term vision, but yeah, going back to what you said about focusing on income is really important because I really realized really early on the first thing I did when I got my sales job out of, out of college, uh, the one where I was making 35 K a year, I started to keep a personal budget and realizing after I was contributing my 401k, I had to pay uncle Sam taxes. And I was like, after my monthly expenses, rent and everything, I had cheap rent too. I was like 700, 800 bucks a month. I was like, I'm saving $200 a month. And that was like huge for me. I was like, that's a lot of money, you know? And then you start to like, realize like where I'm trying to go. And I was like, $200 a month is not going to get me there. I started working at a vineyard on the weekend, like as a little sous chef and pouring wine. Um, so I was making more doing that after taxes than I was before taxes at my sales job per hour. And so I was like, I'm willing to do whatever. Um, but again, I realized I couldn't save my way to financial freedom. So I had to focus on the income. So I focused on a promotion, applying for new jobs and networking. Um, and I wouldn't have gotten that job without kind of networking and interviewing a ton, working way up to that sales job that led into the more money again, that helped fuel the down payments for the first property. I say that all the time when people, you know, start talking about financial independence and, you know, I, my analogy is always you can only get so naked, meaning you can only shed so many expenses uh, before you're just left with what you got. And the real solution is to make more money. And that's how you're going to yeah. reach financial freedom, because how else are you going to buy the assets to get out of the W-2? Um, but, you know, speaking about uh, W-2, uh, you know, you, it's a good thing to have when you are you know, buying properties. You're going to be able to qualify for loans. Let's talk about some of the financing that you've put into place for your properties. Is there anything special that you've been doing with your financing? Uh, have you been just getting conventional loans, commercial financing? Tell us a little bit about how that looks with your business. Yeah. So for the first four properties, we did a few different types of loans. We did uh, three conventional loans, two of which were 15% down conventional investment. Um, and one was a 20% down. And then we also did a secondary home loan on our, one of the properties in Gatlinburg because we had the opportunity to use it as a personal vacation home, which we did use it a couple of times. And then we rented it out when we're not using it. So um, it was within the guidelines of what we're allowed to do. So we took advantage of that 10% down was great. Higher leverage. We had hundred percent cash on cash on that property in the first year, by the way, which was stupid. Um, I love it. Pretty wild. But um, anyways, once we quit our jobs in April of 2021, my wife and I uh, long-term rented our primary residence and then traveled in a camper van for a year. Um, so we were managing four properties at the time from our cell phones, like with half, you know, service only half the time out in the West, Western half of the U S traveling all these national parks. Um, and then once we looked into getting our next two properties, we're like, Oh, we probably don't qualify on the conventional guidelines anymore. So we pivoted to debt service coverage ratio loans, DSCR loans. Um, and we were using that. We used a couple different products, but uh, initially it was trying to find a place in Fort Lauderdale that we could service the debt as a long-term rental. Uh, which worked out. And then um, we had the second one was actually an exception made as a short-term rental investor. They were looking at Rentalizer and AirDNA um, as an exception because we had experience already with uh, multiple properties and uh, from a management perspective. So um, we were able to pivot there where if you guys aren't familiar with DSCR loans, the, those who are listening, um, instead of using my own income uh, to qualify for the loan or DTI, they're actually looking just at my credit score and proof of funds. Um, and they're actually looking at the assets uh, ability to service the debt each month. And at the time they were just looking for a one-to-one -one coverage, um, which isn't too hard in most places to get. Now it's getting a little more difficult with the price of real estate, not for a long-term rental, but for a short-term rental, like that's easy to hit a one-to-one -one or even like a one to 1.25 ratio. What um, kind of interest rates are you looking at on those kind of loans? Because a lot of the lenders I've worked with are looking at like 1.25 for a DSCR. Um, you're finding some just 
one to one uh, lenders. Are, are there higher interest rates generally associated with those loans, or you know, what, what kind of rates are you looking at? Yeah, rates are usually a little bit higher. You know, half a point to a point higher, maybe even higher now. But um, I was still getting DSCR loans in the fours um, early twenty twenty two and late twenty twenty one. Now they're like eight to ten. Well, I'm yeah, sure at so that point it, you're like, damn, this is expensive. I could have got like another three <laughs> percent. Now I'm paying I know. four. I know it's crazy, but I'm happy. Exactly. We actually refied, we refinanced three of our existing properties, two of which we did work on. So we were able to pull out like seven hundred thousand dollars to acquire those most recent two and put a down payment on our current primary residence. So, and I kind of saw the writing on the wall with the interest rates creeping up. I was like, we better do this now um, and refi. So we ref refied them into DSCR loans and pulled out a bunch of a bunch of equity. The only other downside with the DSCR loans is there's a there's typically a higher or stiffer prepayment penalty. And usually for three or five years, unless you spend a lot of money to buy that down to like one year or so. So it's not the perfect fit if you plan to like do the Burr model, right? And you plant your banking on the refi in the next year or two, or if you want to sell, because um, there oftentimes that prepay penalty is going to be kind of stiff. Gotcha. Well, real estate is a long-term investment. So, you know, people yeah. shouldn't be trying to sell and get out of it quickly. Right, Refinancing, right. that's a different... It's a different story for sure. Do do these um, these lenders that you're working with do they push back on your um, assumed income uh, that you're kind of putting forth for the DSCR? Because you know you got you got your traditional rentals and you can kind of find a really easy market rate. Are you able to provide enough information where they feel confident in the projected income that you're going to have? You know, with that business and with that rental property. Yeah, they actually have never asked me to provide projections. They've done their own due diligence from that standpoint. So they've actually looked at the, I forget which what what's the approach, but sales-based approach or comp-based approach on the appraisal report. Um, so they'll pull comps for local long-term rentals and what they've rented for or what the market rent is, and they'll use that. And then I think they take like 70 or 80% of the market rent, and then they use that to qualify um, for the loan. Um, for the short-term rentals, they'll actually just, if they will make an exception, which it's harder to nowadays, but they still will in some cases, they'll look at Rentalizer on AirDNA, which is like a, a, a data website from all data pulled from Airbnb and Verbo um, for any market in the world. But they'll pull that and they'll punch in an address and AirDNA has an algorithm and you know they'll use their own comps to basically forecast conservatively what they think that property would do revenue-wise. Um, so oftentimes uh, the DSCR lenders will make an exception for people who have some experience and use that number. Yeah. I mean, that's super interesting. I've never utilized um, the DSCR loan just because we've been always been able to self fund with, you know, um, and then we moved into commercial, which in commercial, they don't really care if you have guarantors. Um, so it hasn't really come across uh, my desk yet, but it's something that I continue to look at. But with that being said, um, I really wanted to kind of shift the conversation and see like, what what are your goals, man? I mean, like you've created all these businesses in the last three years, you know, you're living a very comfortable lifestyle. I mean, 30, 40 grand a month cash flow. That's exactly where I'm looking to be in the next, you know, 12 to 18 months. So like, what, what are your, what's your ultimate goal? Like break that down for us. Is it, you know, a number of properties? Is it a cash flow number? Is it a helping people, hiring people number? Like what, what's that look like? Yeah, I guess the long-term goal there, for me, there's like three stages of financial freedom. You'll hear this all the time from different people and real estate investors. But for me, stage one, I've already hit, that's like level one financial freedom where you're actually having your passive or residual income cover your lifestyle or basic living expenses, at least. Level two is kind of where I'm at currently, which is I have the money coming in where I can live a bit beyond my means. I could kind of travel. I have the time freedom to do so. Um, you know, if we want to drive a different car, we can, uh, but level three is where I want to go. And that is where, okay, you can live beyond your means. Sure. You could do whatever you want, but you can also kind of give beyond your means and make impactful changes. And, I would love to be able just to like donate a hundred grand or something like that in a quarter or in a year and like not even bat an eye. That would be cool to me and like impact other people's lives. So um, that would be like ultimate goal. It's not necessarily a single monetary figure or income goal. I, I used to do that a lot, but I really try to, I still set goals like that, but I try to avoid that being my end state. It's more of like a, a state of being is what I'm after. So 
Um, what lifestyle do I want to live? Do I, how much do I want to travel? How much time do I want to spend with my wife? And I just had a, we have a two month old daughter. I'm going on three months. So hopefully we'll have more and just kind of just live a kick-ass life. Um, so that's really ultimately what I'm after. And there's like a very fine line that I want to tread because I see a lot of people who they just get hungry, 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 hungry. It's kind of like the Grant Cardone model. Like I'm going to 10X like every year. And it's very admirable, but at the same time, like I want to live with life with as little regret as possible. And the last thing I want to do is be 80 or hundred years old on my deathbed being like, oh man, I'm really proud of all my accomplishments and how much I grown, how much money I made. But like, I wish I spent more time doing X, Y, and Z when I was 30, 40, 50 years old. Mm -hmm. um, so that's ultimately what I'm after is just like live a great life, impact others around me. Um, and then short term, I'm really focused on growing multiple businesses and just um, trying to hire so I could be out of the operations as much. I've been way too in the weeds with as an operator. And I want to kind of move myself more into the business owner and high level viewpoint vantage point, and then hire great operators, employees to help grow them. So you said you've got a two month old right now. Have you already given up the van life or is that something? Oh yeah. You've van life's got gone. going consistently still, or, you know, what's, what's the van life look like now that you've got that two month old? No. Yeah. We, we sold the van. Uh, we traveled, we were like off grid in the van. We had solar and everything. We were off grid for like six, six months, kind of all over the place. And then uh, we spent about five or six months in Fort Lauderdale setting up those two properties and um, we're in the van, but mostly just in the houses once we had some mattresses to, to sleep on um, and then moved to Greenville, South Carolina, where my wife and I currently live. Once we found out she was pregnant, we were like, we should probably buy a house or get a bigger van. And we're like, we're not <laughs> or get a van. bigger van, we're not getting a bigger van. <laughs> so I think yeah. that's when I started seeing um, <clears throat> your videos on TikTok was like doing them in the van when you guys were like, you, you were doing them in the van and talking about like the monthly breakdowns is when I really started like seeing them blowing up on TikTok. And it felt like you were on my feed like every day. I was like, <laughs> what the hell? what's going on with this guy, man? Yeah. So yeah. So, so now I, I think that's really admirable too, is like a lot of people have this perception of real estate investors and people, you know, when you're like, oh, what do you do? It's like, oh, well, I'm in real estate or I have short-term rentals. Everyone thinks like it's all about the money. Like it really, and I think the more people we talk to and almost every single person that we have talked to, um, the goal is really more about the lifestyle that comes from the money and not necessarily being like, Oh, I, you know, am worth $10 million or, you know, I make a million dollars a year type of thing. It's spending time with family, being there for your, for your now, you know, almost three month old, more kids, like all of that. So I, I think that is uh that's super fantastic. You know, you sound like extremely humble, which I think is, is great, you know, cause I think more people, need to realize that when you're talking about financial freedom and financial independence, that that's really what it's all about. It's your time freedom. We're all, we're all working for that. Like it's the ability to do this, to sit down for an hour or two and have a conversation with us. And like you said, try to help others and be able to, to donate, um, you know, money to causes that like get you excited about giving back, you know? Um, so, so that's really cool. I, I wanted to get into kind of though, like you talked about, wanting to start hiring more people for your business, um, kind of getting, becoming the business owner instead of the business operator. Like what kind of challenges, you know, do you see yourself facing um, trying to kind of step back a little bit? Yeah. I mean, it's anyone who's like built something from the ground up, like it's like your baby almost, you know, it's like you have to get out of the mindset and I'm so guilty of this. And I've had, I've had this in the back of my mind for years, but like the mindset of if I, if you want it done right, you got to do it yourself. And it's so hard to let go and give trust in someone else and allow them to make mistakes with something that you've kind of tried to perfect over the years. But until you do, you're going to be bottleneck after bottleneck after bottleneck. And that's what I've run into. Um, and also my, my time freedom that I had worked so hard to achieve in the camp, uh, camper van life and all this, all of a sudden I found myself working like 10 to 12 hour days. And I was loving it because I was doing stuff I actually liked versus the sales job I had before. However, you know, my wife was like, you know, I thought, I thought the whole point was the time freedom. And I'm like, I know you're right. Like, I need to figure out a way to continue to have these things operate and grow, but remove myself from the operations. And I was like, even if I make less money, like the less percentage of, you know, the revenue as income, I can scale way further by hiring great people. So that's what I've had to do. And most of it has like 
been evolved around, yes, I've offloaded the management for the property, but we had that pretty dialed in. It wasn't like the crazy, like we were managing six properties, you know, from our phones pretty easily, but these other things like the, the course for teaching other people and then my Instagram and TikTok grew. So it was like figuring out systems, um, to like actually make a business or businesses from social media and monetize on my brand and impact other people um, at the same time. So I've had to hire for those, for those businesses, um, which has been crucial because like this week, I think I've, I've just reached, like I've hired like five people in the past month and a half. And it's been amazing. Like seeing sales come in that I had no particular part in uh, has been wonderful. Um, and they're doing a great job and I'm paying them well to do it. So um, it's been awesome. So I'm, I'm hoping to continue to be more of the business owner mindset and continue to remove myself from operations. Cause I think all my stuff is going to grow way better and be more effective and help more people um, more efficiently moving forward by, by doing that. So let me ask you this. Now that you've got these um, uh, multiple irons in the fire, you're building businesses and you're becoming a legit entrepreneur. You've got a lot of these things and the perpetual motion machine going. Do those get a little bit more interesting to you than owning the, the Airbnb properties themselves? Do you think that, for example, starting the management business or starting the coaching services or whatever other businesses you have that you can start uh, might become more attractive in certain ways uh, than, than the real estate? Yeah. And a lot of people on TikTok, I mean, I think they're trying to heckle or harass me and other people who kind of do the course thing. One, I never thought I would create content or do coursework and teach, like be a coach for other people, but I ended up enjoying it. And you can all, it's a very profitable business. I mean, low overhead. Um, and if you're good at teaching other people that like you can scale a coaching business, if you have like the following and know how to do ads and stuff like that way faster than you could your real estate investments. You know, the time it takes me to do my research, evaluate properties, invest, stand up, manage is a lot more time than continuously posting content from my office in my house or in a camper van somewhere, and then setting up a system to where we can coach people. Um, so I think it's really more about like risk mitigation and and kind of diversifying some of the income streams. Um, but I will always continue to buy real estate um, just because I love the cash flow, but the tax advantages, you know, being having a high income now in these other aspects, like I pay myself as a W2 employee. That's how I get paid from, from one of my businesses, for example. So I pay a lot of money to the U S government and I'm trying to reduce that in every legal way possible. And the number one advice I get from my CPA is just buy more property, buy more property, buy more property. So I'll never stop buying real estate, but some of those other areas are, are more scalable in my opinion. Um, and as long as I'm, you know, have a good business and I'm helping other people do the same thing as what I'm doing. Like, I don't see anything wrong with, with getting paid, paid to do that. So, um, I'll continue to focus on kind of all fronts. Absolutely. And I, I kind of share in your philosophy too. I mean, I think that starting a business is the way to generate the cash flow, that income. And real estate is the most spectacular, leveraged, uh, compounding machine that I think that a lot of people have to put money to work uh, passively one way or another, either through you know short-term rentals or syndications or commercial real estate, whatever. Um, you know, it really hands down uh, a very special asset to compound wealth. Um, going forward. But I, I do want to ask you, you know, if, if you had to talk to a new investor, uh, someone who's getting into the game, um, they want to take down their first uh, short term Airbnb. W what's that one key uh, piece of advice that you would give them uh, before they really, you know, took the leap and got started? Um, probably that you don't have to know everything or you don't have to have every piece of the puzzle figured out before starting. It prevented me from getting started for multiple years. I was so nervous. I didn't have enough information that I became the guy who knew as much as possible about real estate without actually having an investment. Um, and then the other thing too, which is discourages a lot of people. And what's really fascinating about short-term rentals is you don't need a ton of money necessarily. Obviously you can partner with people, which is also great if you partner with someone who's experienced, but you could do rental arbitrage where you just do a lease. We can get permission from the landlord to basically furnish and re-rent. I mean, you could start with 10 to $15,000 for a smaller unit and just scale the cash flow game. You don't get all the benefits from owning, but as far as getting your feet wet and building a cash flowing machine, like you could totally get started. Um, and, and with less risk, cause you're not, you're not taking on a mortgage or anything like that. So um, I would say those two things, you don't have to know everything to get started. And then you also don't have to have an absurd amount of money to get your, get, you get that first property under your belt. I couldn't agree more. And for everybody that wants to hear about 
a very successful person that has done that, go back and listen to our episode with Yamu, where she has 15 arbitrage Airbnbs that she was doing. And uh, it was crazy. Yeah, she was she was renting like two or three apartments at an apartment complex at once, but like staggering them like, hey, I'll take ownership of this one. And then two months later, this one. And then two months later, I'll get the third one. So like they were all paying for themselves at once. Like it was crazy, you know, so I totally believe that uh, the arbitrage thing works. I think that's great advice, too. As an owner of an apartment building, I've had people come and ask me if I'd be willing to arbitrage for Airbnb. And I'm like, wait a minute, if you want to put an Airbnb in my apartment, like, why don't I just do it? So we ended up doing that. So we have one uh, Airbnb that's that's doing OK. Um, so so that's really fantastic. I did want to ask you, though, um, going back onto like the whole the whole business thing, like what what was it that really sparked not not just like the time freedom thing? But I, I've I've seen a lot of like the Harmozies on all the time. And they always said like, yeah, you could be 100% and get everything done right. But if you could hire someone and them even do it 80% as good as you, like you said, you know, like you're going to scale a lot quicker because you can multiply more people out than yourselves. Like how was it hiring like that first person? And, and what what did that person, you know, take off of your plate for you that, you know, kind of led you down the path to hire five people in the last six weeks, you know? Yeah. Yeah. The first person was somebody who he was actually my first, uh, year long one-on-one -on -one coaching client. I had just launched this. I was doing like, first of all, I'll back it up. I was doing like free calls, people reaching out on TikTok and Instagram. And I was like, sure, I'll take a free call and help you out. No big deal. A couple people are like, you should charge for this. I'm like, really? You know, then I built a video course, sold that, sold hundreds of those, which has been awesome. Tons of success moved into the coaching because I had people like, well, what if I wanted one-on-one -on -one, like mentorship? And I was like, okay, well, let me think about what I would charge for that. Definitely undercharged at the beginning, but it was still worthwhile because I fostered some awesome relationships uh, with this guy, Logan West. Now I coached for a year and he had two long-term rentals and he and his wife were basically like all in. And he's like, definitely all in. He scaled to 50 K a month cash flow in 15 months on short-term rentals. Uh, he did like four buys, one arbitrage. Then he partnered with people in my Facebook group and did no money out of his pocket, scaled to not up to nine units now for those last three or four that was, you know, he partnered on. So he had come back to me and he's like, Hey, I'd be interested in like coaching with you if you're open to it. And I was like, I mean, yeah, you're my most successful, like student ever, like would love that, you know? So I started basically funneling, uh, people to him for like a three month one-on-one -on -one coaching program. And I would just take a cut of it and then pay him the rest. And he was doing really great there. And he's like, Hey, I really like this. And I was like, Hey, Logan, I'm basically going to consolidate all my offerings to a higher ticket one. Would you want to coach with me in it and be one of the dedicated coaches? And he's like, sure. And he also had a sales background. So I'm like, Hey, Logan, I'm tired of taking all these sales calls because a higher ticket, you have to like speak with somebody over zoom or the phone, make sure they're comfortable. And it's a good fit for both parties. And he's like, well, I'll do sales calls too. So I started paying him commission to do sales calls. And I was like, okay, this is how people scale. And I saw other people doing it this way. I was like, all right. Um, so I had helped someone help me with my Instagram and manage my DMs and basically funnel and qualify appointments to get set for him. Um, so he was ultimately my first hire for like multiple different things, both on the coaching and the sales front. Now he's going to move into more of a sales management role now that I've hired, you know, three reps and I have two more coming on uh, this week and next. Um, so hopefully that wasn't too long of drawn out, <laughs> drawn out answer to your question. Not at all, man. I mean, that that's super exciting. And I think I think a lot of people need to hear that sometimes. I know I needed to hear that because like I'm at a particular point in my business where I know that I need to bring somebody on in some capacity, you know, like I know that. And it's just I think for me kind of hearing that, like, you know, having just getting some of that time back during the day, during the week where you can focus on those other things that are ultimately going to help you scale the business even more, you know? And I think sometimes, like you said, you just, you can't see it until you do it. Like you, like, like you, like you said, you, you knew all of the things about real estate, but you didn't know any, you know, like, you know, all the proper ways to kind of build a business, you know, and work on your business instead of in your business. But until you take action, until you decide, commit and take that action, you know, you don't necessarily see it. And then once you do, you're like, holy crap, I should have did this a long time ago. Oh my God. So, yeah. hundred yeah. percent. 
I, I think that's awesome, man. And I think that's a perfect segue into the next segment of the show that James and I like to call the big, the big four. four. Kick it All off, right. James. Yes, sir. All right, Michael. So this one, pretty simple. Uh, what's something that you do or did uh, that you kind of consider in your life to be a financial independence hack? Something that's kind of like a, a cheat code. <laughs> that's a good one. I mean, it's like the cop out is just like getting into short term rentals, but um, I feel honestly, like, you have all these, uh, like this great yeah, history of like, would, frugal living, man. Like you got to have a good yeah frugal. frugal like, like honestly, this this is going to be. I'll, I'll explain why it's kind of a cheesy answer, but I'll explain why it's important is you have to have a personal budget. I honestly don't have not kept one in over probably two years now, but I was every single day putting in, I don't care if I spent an extra dollar on guac at Chipotle, I was putting that in my budget, like every penny in and penny out. And I had to have a good understanding of how money flowed through my life. Um, and that's what made me more frugal. I was like, well, if I can cut out this expense and this expense, then I could save an extra $200 like, that's amazing. You know, then I started like, well, what if I could invest in the stock market a little bit? Or, okay, I can save up for real estate. But ultimately, that's what got me interested in like side hustling. And hey, if my ultimate goal is financial freedom, I have to understand how money works. If I ever want to own my own business, which I never thought I would until now, um, like you're never going to be able to operate a business if you cannot operate your own personal finances mm -hmm. successfully. Um, because if you can't manage money, you're, you're in for a rude awakening um, down the road. But yeah, I think personal budget is is really critical and a lot of a lot of what most people overlook in their own lives. They're like, oh man, I'm broke. I'm paycheck to paycheck. Well, how much do you make? I'm making eighty thousand a year, a hundred thousand a year. Like, where that where's that money going? Do you I don't know. You know, it's like if it's in my account, I'll spend it. Like money comes and money goes. I've heard people say that. And I'm like, like, no, it doesn't. Like <laughs> you gotta take control of that money and and understand how money works if you want to get out of the rat race. Um, so I think ultimately the hack was just understanding my own personal budget and then figuring out how much money I needed to go make. And again, that pivoted me to focus on my income and less on savings. Cause I was like doing the math. I can't save my way to wealth. I have to make more money and then I have to invest more money and then make more money and invest more money until it just like starts compounding. Like you were mentioning before, James. Absolutely. You know, I, I think that's a great, a great point. Um, finances, you know, that's gotta be your number one step in my household. Uh, we've got this really unique uh, strategy uh, my wife's money we can that she earns we can spend uh, and then everything I earn myself into her business like we're reinvesting and then you know, every now and then I'll go to my wife's you know our joint account and like money will just disappear that I happen to invest by accident she's like where the hell did our money go I was like oh man. we ended up investing some of yours too but you know finding ways to segregate the money in, as, as part of your financial independence journey um, whether it's like Patrick's uh, strategy of having that bank account that's hidden you don't have access to you keep depositing money into it automatically, whatever it might be, find a strategy that works for you and just stick to it. Yeah. I loved yeah. it. I loved it. I mean, I thought that was a great, a, a great hack too. Like, Hey, if you can't, if you don't have your money shit together personally, like how are you going to do building a business with, you know, a couple employees that are relying on you to pay them like, and you, you don't have a budget or know how it works. So I, I think that's great. So the next one is uh, we like to call is resources. So we're, so um, are there any particular books, uh, podcast or people that um, really affected you, you know, really sparked something inside of you on your financial independence journey, on your short term rental journey, on your, you know, mindset business journey that, you know, you think our listeners would benefit from, from going and checking out? Yeah, I mean, honestly, I get a lot of value from some other content creators that are already doing or living the lifestyle that I'm after and that are open and transparent about it. Not, not so much the fluffy stuff, like some of that's okay, you know? Um, but I will say like, as far as like a book is concerned, there's such there's so many great podcasts and YouTube channels, but one book that was just like the, the, like a pivotal, pivotal point in my life and my mindset was Cashflow Quadrant, which is more or less a sequel of Rich Dad, Poor Dad. And the book kind of drags out a little bit you know, like a lot of the rich dad stuff does. However, the one key takeaway I had from that book, if I didn't remember anything else from it, was the uh, perception of risk. Um, and I was always very risk averse, very scared to invest more than a few thousand dollars in the stock market. And I was like, you know, I have to readjust how I think about this. And a lot of people are assuming, well, I'm not going to buy an Airbnb. I'm not going to buy a real estate investment. What if no one rents it? What if, you know, the market tanks? Well, what's on the flip side of the coin? 
is it is it actually safe and secure to rely on your your current job and your employer? Um, and I didn't want to risk working that job and relying on somebody else for the next 40 to 60 years of my life and then get to the point, again, the regret minimization framework of, man, I just did all this. Like, was that risk really, was taking that step towards real estate, was it that risky? Like, it became way more risky, in my opinion, to not make that investment. And then for, it was like a light bulb from then on. I was just like, as long as the numbers make sense, like I'm in, like, I don't even have to second guess it. Um, sometimes maybe depleting a little bit too much in my bank account for some of my investments. But again, when you're all in and, and you have that mindset, like, like the, the stress kind of melts away a little bit and you feel more comfortable taking that next step. Yeah, I absolutely love that. Any of those YouTube channels you were saying, uh, cause you know, our, I know our, our listeners out there, they love diving in and kind of digging into your particular, like mindset and strategy and business stuff so you know i yeah. think the book uh, one was great but do you got any uh any other like influencers or youtube channels that you might recommend everybody go subscribe to yeah i mean there's so many good ones like i like hermosi a lot most of the short form stuff but the one like going back a few years and i still watch his videos every once in a while uh, was graham stefan and the reason i liked his channel was because he did a annual breakdown this helped him get more followers too of how much money he made from youtube how much money he made from affiliates and real estate and the other businesses. And that's what actually made me interested in starting a YouTube channel. I'm like, I don't know who wants to listen to me, probably no one, but like, maybe I'll make a video or two. And even if I made a little money through YouTube or just like increased, like, or grew my network in some way, shape or form, that's what intrigued me to actually make that first step. I bought his YouTube Academy, which was decent. Um, it just kind of opened my eyes to building a brand and how to monetize from it. Um, and if I didn't watch his YouTube, I don't think I would ever have started creating content seriously. Um, and since then I've consumed so many other different people's, you know, content, um, short form, long form, whatever it may, may be that has really opened my eyes to all these different businesses. Like I'm not a pioneer in like any of the spaces I do. I've just kind of figured out how, how they do it successfully and how I can make it work for me too. And what I'm trying to accomplish. Yeah. And if you're, I mean, if you're in this space and you don't know grants, uh, um, Grant Stefan or uh, like meet Kevin. Like I was like a huge meet yeah, Kevin meet guy. Kevin. Yeah, I and, followed him a lot. And like, like they all did the same kind of thing. So that that kind of got me me going on the uh, on the same thing as well. So appreciate you sharing that, man. James, number three. All right, Michael. So this one's future you. I want you to paint a picture of yourself five years in the future, personally, business side, uh, however, whichever way you want to take it. Uh, where is Michael uh, five years from now? Five years from now, I'd like to have at least one, if not two more kids, um, preferably at least one boy, but I like being a girl dad too. So I'd be okay if there was two girls and one boy. Um, and I'd like to build uh, more or less a dream house up on Lake Winnipesaukee in New Hampshire to use for a few months out of the year in the summertime. Um, Cause I grew up going to that Lake and just like a tiny little cabin that my grandparents owned. And I would love to, to build something that you know, multiple generations can use in the future. So I'd love to build that. Um, and also, uh, I would love to see multiple of the businesses that I'm currently to work on working on. Um, I would like to maybe sell one of them if we grow to a point of that where we could really cash out. Um, and, but really it's more around like the lifestyle and family. I'd like to be able to pick up and travel whenever we want. Um, my wife loves to travel internationally. So I would love to continue to, to be doing those things, uh, you know, for the next several years. Which, which business of yours do you think will be the most marketable and sellable at, in the future? Or do you think it's just, it, it would be a business you haven't yet started? I think the the one that will be most sellable is the vacation rental management business. And I don't know if we want to sell it. I'm, I'm, I have a partner in that business and he runs more of the day-to-day -day operations um, and acting as CEO. So um, if we grew it to a point where we could sell for a decent multiple, like two to five X EBITDA, um, you know, I mean, that that those businesses can be quite profitable. So as long as we scale thoughtfully and do the right things by our homeowners and, and do a great job making them money, it would not, it would not be difficult to sell to another great PM who's bigger than us that is willing to pay a solid multiple. Um, I mean, if we could sell for like a hundred million dollars or something like that, I mean, that's something I would never even fathom, you know, a couple of years ago. So I think focusing more on growing a business that either we could exit or just continue to grow and sustain long-term and just continue to move our out of operations a little bit higher, like great operators to work with us and grow it um, that way. But I think that one would be, as far as selling would be concerned, the coaching business I think is going to be probably the highest income producing thing for me 
currently. Um, but I don't know how, how difficult it would be to sell that without selling myself with the business because it's most of the sales are based on my personal brand. Right. Exactly. Exactly. Amazing, amazing things though, to be even discussing and considering, you know, where, where you were, you know, five years ago. So it's, uh, pretty awesome. We appreciate you coming on the podcast and sharing your story, your vision of the future and your investment strategy with all of our listeners. For those who haven't heard of you yet, know where to follow you. Where are the best places for them to reach out? Website, Instagram, TikTok, you know, lay it all out on the line. Yeah. All my social media handles are mlefonte6. Um, and you could DM me on Instagram. Uh, you could follow me on those if you'd like. Um, and then website, if you guys are interested, obviously, and, in, you know, looking for a mentor or coach in short-term rentals, bnbinvestoracademy.com would be the, the place to go. We love it. All right. This is the time in the podcast where you guys know what to do. If you haven't already, like this video, drop a comment below, go leave us a review. James and I are doing this for free. So we love to hear your feedback and a positive review on Apple, Google, Buzzsprout, any of those things, go out there, do it, and uh, we'll catch you next time. Thanks, guys. Peace. See you guys.